Hello everyone, it's the Historical Gamer once again, and today we're returning to Cold Waters, the new game out by Killerfish Games, uh, which puts you in charge of a uh, nuclear, or well, so far only a nuclear-powered U.S. submarine during a hypothetical Third World War. Uh, the game will be adding Russian submarines before too long, but up to this point, uh, you just play as the Americans. In this game, you are playing in a hypothetical Third World War. As I said, the game is very much the spiritual successor to Red Storm Rising, a 1990 or 80 classic, uh, which is based off the book Red Storm Rising by Tom Clancy. The game puts you in charge of a submarine as a third-person view, so it has a somewhat SSN-type feel, if you're familiar with the game that was based off the Tom Clancy SSN novel, uh, which looked at an uh, Asian uh, conflict between the United States and China in the 1990s. Uh, where you had the exterior view of the submarine. In that sense, uh, this game reminds me a lot of that. Uh, we are 34 days into our campaign here in this video. Uh, that means we're more than a month into war. We've sunk more than 31 enemy ships. We've sunk more than 180,000 tons of enemy ships, and we've accomplished nine missions. Thus far, the war is starting to turn in the Allies' favor, uh, the Allies being the NATO Allies, which is who we represent. Uh, but so far, the war is not decided. Uh, we have won a Bronze Star and a Silver Star, but again, that is not the point of this video. So as you will have uh, remembered, if you've seen the previous videos, uh, we've talked about the Foxtrot class, the Narwhal class. We've talked about warships that aren't in the game, like the USS Tang class and the German Type 21 submarine. In addition to that, we've talked about the U.S. Navy at the end of World War II and its uh, rise into the early Cold War period. And in this video, we're going to return to that series. Rather than look at one specific submarine in isolation, however, this time we're going to do double duty. So if you've remembered, we've already talked about the U.S. Navy and its submarine fleet as it was at the end of World War II and the dawn of the Cold War. We've then talked about some modernization that occurred in the U.S. fleet with the Guppy program, the Greater Underwater Propulsion uh, program, which basically was looking at improving U.S. fleet boat submarines which were thoroughly modern and up-to-date uh, at the end of World War II but which were made obsolete by many of the innovations and developments which occurred under the Type 21 program of Nazi Germany but never really came into combat. So the Guppy program was designed to upgrade these fleet boats which had only been a couple of years old but were now were rendered more or less obsolete because the understanding was that the Russians would develop their submarines with the innovations in the Type 21 class as well. In our last video, we looked at the first U.S. post-World War II submarine design, the Tang class, which is the first large fleet boat uh, effort that the United States Navy made after World War II and incorporated many of the de designs and upgrades uh, that the Type 21 class of Germany had, except it was a U.S. designed submarine. Uh, in that video, uh, we, we got a glimpse into the future fast attack boats of the U.S. Navy. But it's important to understand that there was an attitude shift that took place at the end of the Cold or at the end of World War II and at the beginning of the Cold War, where the U.S. Navy realized, listen, you know, the, the traditional use of submarines as commerce raiders, as anti-warship raiders, that's not sufficient for us to have a large submarine fleet. And so the Navy was grasping, and I've mentioned this a few times in a few of our different videos, the Navy was grasping for different ways that they could use their submarines effectively, or different reasons that they needed to continue having a submarine fleet. So they looked at things as using submarines as cargo vessels, you know, you can get in and get out covertly with supplies. Uh, they had used that during World War II to some success during the evacuations of the Philippines. They were looking at using them still as, you know, anti-surface warfare vessels, uh, anti-submarine uh, warfare vessels, uh, guided missile carriers, there was a thought they could be used for that, and reconnaissance gathering platforms. While the Tang class took a lot of what the Type 21 uh, did, it wasn't necessarily a change in, in thought in how the submarine would be used. Again, they were taking a ship that the Germans designed to destroy convoys and warships and basically just created their own. The problem was the Russian Navy didn't have a lot of warships at the end of World War II. The odds of the U.S. seeing a lot of those warships at sea were pretty small, and the strongest part of the Russian Navy at the end of World War II was its submarine force. And so, as we've talked about previously, the Navy had to try and figure out what it was going to do with its submarine fleet, and more specifically, what it was going to design for the future. How was it going to justify to Congress that it needed more submarines? And the recognition that the Russian submarine force was the strongest part of the Russian Navy uh, kind of came into, into the crux of, of the debate on how the U.S. should move forward with its submarines. 
the United States Navy made the decision that it was going to use submarines as a principal anti-submarine warfare uh, mechanism. And that's because they believed the threat to the Russian submarine force was grave. Uh, in one uh, Navy admiral uh, discussing kind of the view of the Russian Navy at the end of World War II, uh, he said, an assumption that the Russians will maintain their number of submarines in approximately the same amount that they have now, but improve their types and replace older types with new ones, and the second assumption that by 1960, or within 10 years, 1958, that the Russians could have 2,000 up-to-date submarines, I have chosen that latter figure because I believe it is within their industrial capacity of producing that number, and I believe that they really intend to employ the submarine as a mean of preventing the United States or her allies for operating overseas, that 2,000 would be the number they would require from their force. This was a vast increase in the submarine force of the Soviet Union. Uh, there was a, a quote in 1948 of a Russian admiral also saying that they could have a submarine force of up to 1,200 submarines. However, there's very little actual documentation in the Soviet Union to say that the Soviets planned for such a force. Uh, there was actual naval intelligence that was done to say that the maximum the Russians could support just in terms of birthing space for the submarines, uh, the amount of water, distilled water they had, which would be necessary for the use of batteries, which would power all of these submarines, and the amount of fuel that the Russians would have uh, in access to their, their submarines would not allow a force in excess of 400 uh, submarines. Nonetheless, in early 1940, the late 1940s, around 1948, the U.S. Navy firmly believed that the Russians were somehow going to create a uh, force of 400 plus, you know, be it 1,200 or 2,000 uh, submarines, which would be used to stop the United States from being able to get access to Western Europe. So the key sort of viewpoint from the Navy is that the way the Soviets were going to prevent the United States, which had by far the strongest Navy in the world at the time, from supporting Western Europe in the event of a war between the U.S. and Western Europe, was basically putting these submarines out here as pickets or as kind of mobile minefields where convoys would be prevented from gaining access to Western Europe by Russian submarines. Very much a traditional submarine threat against surface vessels. The question was how were the Allies going to counter this? And the Americans and the British, more specifically the Americans, viewed that U.S. submarines could be used as an anti-submarine warfare uh, weapon. Uh, they believed that there were 58 German, submarine, German and Japanese submarines during World War II that were sunk by Allied submarines themselves, and they believed that that meant the submarine could be an effective anti-submarine uh, warfare weapon. The problem was that only one of these submarines was actually submerged when it was sunk. All of the other submarines were sunk on the surface. Only HMS Venture sank U-864 off Norway in early 1945 when both submarines were fully submerged. And so that's sort of an interesting little tidbit. Nonetheless, as early as 1946, the United States Navy's Operational Evaluation Group had proposed the use of submarines as anti-submarine warfare weapons. Uh, that September, uh, the chairman of the planning group of submarine officers conference noted, with the further development and construction and effective numbers of new submarines by any foreign power, the employment of our submarines in anti-submarine work may well become imperative. So it was viewed that the uh, even as early as 1946, the Navy's anti-submarine warfare conference proposed equal priority for specialized small anti-submarine warfare submarines, as well as the new Tang class submarine. So the Navy was beginning beginning to develop this ideology of a hunter-killer submarine, a submarine that would be used in the destruction of enemy submarines. It would basically lie in wait off of Russian shores for Russian submarines to start coming out of their ports and, and coming to the Atlantic to threaten uh, you know, U.S. convoys and U.S. naval assets, these submarines would wait quietly for the Russians to leave their ports, and they would ambush them on their way to combat zones. And in many ways, at least in my viewpoint, this was kind of the birth of the hunter, or more specifically, this was kind of the birth of the fast attack submarine. That's because today, submarines' principal purpose, they're very general purpose, right? Submarines are going to be used in uh, dropping off special forces, engaging surface threats, and engaging submarine threats. But a big focus, this new addition of focus of anti-submarine tasking was Again, it was brand new. It was something that submarines were kind of viewed that way. The British had developed a, a small number of submarines during World War II, specifically with the intent of engaging German submarines. I believe it was the R-Class. There were 12 of them that were laid down during World War I. None of them were finished in time to play an active role in World War I. Uh, but 
outside of that, it was really the first time that submarines were being used or being thought of in being used in a uh, substantial anti-submarine warfare effort. There were some examples in World War II of the S-class boats by the U.S. being sent uh, to be used in anti-submarine uh, warfare duties against the Germans in, in World War II, but most of that was a, you know, all right, if the enemy surfaces, maybe we'll be able to destroy them. At the very least, we can, we can kind of put ships in the water that'll prevent them from being able to surface and be able to be effectively employed, but it wasn't really the thought of the principal use of this, this weapon would be an anti-submarine warfare. That was relatively new. So in order to accomplish this, uh, you know, this desire to have a hunter-killer submarine, a new submarine would have to be designed. And that's, you know, in addition to this changing ideology uh, being part of the topic of this video, the other topic is the U.S. K-class submarines, uh, notably the K-1 submarine, which is the first of this class, which were to be designed as an anti-submarine uh, task force or an anti-submarine uh, submarine. For the first time, a sub was going to be designed from the ground up to attack enemy submarines, at least from the U.S. perspective. I already mentioned the, the British exception during World War I. Also, it's worth noting that with the K-class, which would just sort of, to avoid confusion, they, they were originally considered the K-1-class submarine, and they'd have numerous submarines. You'd have the K-1, the K-2, the K-3, and, and sort of this idea of having a multiple submar a, a large submarine force in this class. In addition to that, these submarines uh, were the first that were going to be classified as SSKs, which essentially meant, you know, SS would be the, the submarine. I don't know if it's submersible ship or something, uh, but then the K stands for killer. So again, this this beginning of the hunter-killer submarines, this new class of submarines. Today, generally, diesel submarines are referred to SSKs, so they're, they're killer submarines, nuclear submarines, fast attack subs, uh, which are kind of the same thing, but the nuclear variant would be considered SSNs, so submersible ship nuclear. I'm, I'm making an assumption here. Uh, the K-class would end up being referred to as the Barracuda class in retrospect, but at the time it was designed, it was called the K-class. So some of the key factors with the submarine class is they wanted to originally make a small submarine. They had thought of making an easily reproducible submarine that wasn't necessarily made by shipyards that were only used to uh, making submarines. So kind of a similar mindset to what went behind the German Type 21, where you have these submarines sort of assembled away from a dockyard and then just kind of or, or built away from dockyards and then assembled at, you know, at an actual facility. Um, and then put in the water. So originally there were some preliminary designs for the SSKs before the K-class kind of had, had evolved that would have had very small submarines, you know, a 250-ton boat uh, at one point with only a crew of two officers and 12 enlisted men, a 14-man crew and 250 tons. Uh, there was an additionally a later design that had 450 tons, uh, but again, it revealed that both of these submarines would have had uh, submerged endurances that were far too small to be practical. Uh, so they ended up needing to make the boats a little bit bigger. And at the end of the day, the K-Class ended up being around 740 tons, which is approximately the same size as the German Type 7 submarine, uh, which was the kind of workhorse of the German Navy during World War II. These boats would be fitted with a large BQR-4 sonar array. This is a passive sonar array, which was basically an enhanced and enlarged version of BQR-2. So I mentioned earlier that the BQR-2 in a previous video was basically just a copy of the German passive sonar system that was used on U-boats during World War II, which was vastly superior to what the U.S. Navy used in, uh, in World War II. So the BQR-2 was a copy of the German Navy's uh, sonar suite, uh, which was used in World War II. The BQR-4 was an enlarged version of that. So the BQR-4 actually had uh, a, a sonar suite that had more than 58 hydrophones, uh, that were mounted in, uh, and I'm quoting from this Cold War submarine book I've been reading, uh, that were mounted in sort of a circular arrangement. That was similar to how it was set up on the BQR-2, uh, but there was actually a, a um, more effective way in which the sonar suite was mounted, uh, and also a more effective way in which the sonar suite was steered. So I'm not quite sure, I don't entirely understand it, but I know if you look at like World War II movies or World War II U-boats, you'll see they kind of have this manual directional aiming of the sonar to 
understand where sounds are coming from. The BQR4 did that in a more effective manner that actually created less noise. Turning the sonar uh, on, a, on, a, on an old BQR2 or on a GHG actually generated some noise. So this was something that was uh, more effective. Uh, the sonar was mounted in a dome near the very front of the submarine uh, as far away as possible from the, the machinery at the back of the boat that, that turned the screws. That's because that machinery generated a bunch of noise. Uh, and as a result, putting your, your sonar as far away as possible meant that you had a, a more clear sonar picture. Uh, the BQR had an estimated range of up to 20 nautical miles, uh, which was vastly superior uh, to the previous sonars. Uh, those tended to have a range of up to 10 miles. In ideal conditions, the sonar could actually listen out as far as 35 miles, or at least that was the hope uh, that the sonar would be able to, to track targets you know, dramatically further out. In addition to that BQR-4 sonar suite, the submarine had a BQR-2 on it as well, which was used for more close-range targets. That would be something that would be closer to around 10 nautical miles and was a far more accurate sonar system so that it would be used more for fire control. So the BQR-4 is kind of used to identify and locate targets. The BQR-2 uh, would be used in order to refine your targeting package and get your actual you know, fire control uh, ready for torpedo attacks against enemy targets. Additionally, there was a small BQR-3 sonar set, which was the Navy's World War II uh, version of passive sonar. That could be used as a backup for both the BQR-2 and the BQR-4. Additionally, it could be used to transmit a acoustic ping, so an active sonar ping, for accurate ranging in terms of coming up with your final solution uh, for your, your firing solution. There were other innovations as well, such as making the air conditioning and the cooling in the in the uh, submarine somehow self-quieting. I'm not quite sure I fully understand that, but basically it would allow the submarine to be a more quiet submarine. Originally, when the submarine was proposed, uh, the Navy called for a fleet of over 960 boats that would be built to counter up to 1,200 to 2,000 Russian submarines. These submarines had a slower submerged performance, or at least that was the intent, would only be about eight and a half knots uh, below the ocean, uh, but the intent was basically to lay these almost like a minefield across the likely approaches of Russian submarines to the Atlantic, which is interestingly enough a tactic that you'll end up seeing reused when the fleet became more capable. You saw these SOSIS lines of sonar buoys that would be laid across the North Atlantic in order to kind of create a barrier that the Soviets would have to break out into the Atlantic Ocean to pose any threat to convoys. So this was a, a early iteration of that idea, of that idea, an early iteration of that strategy, in which the you know the boats would need to um, you know break through a line of American submarines to pose a threat to U.S. convoys moving to Western Europe, uh, and that was something that was first looked at uh, with the SSK class. Uh, the first boats that were authorized uh, were the was the K-1. It was authorized in 1948. Construction began, uh, well, funding, uh, fiscal year 1948. Uh, construction began in 1947, and there were two more boats that were authorized the following year. Um, these were ordered in place of an additional Tang class submarine. So we mentioned in the previous video, the Tangs only had a couple of them built because they were very expensive. Uh, so they were ending up purchasing two K2, the K2 and the K3 were ordered uh, in lieu of an additional Tang class submarine. Uh, the intent was to build a whole bunch of these, as I've already said. Uh, they would end up being on station off Greenland and Iceland, Southern England. Uh, there were talks of being on station near Petroplinsk, uh, the Curly Island. Islands, uh, offshore, off of China. Um, you know, in essence, there'd be up to 300 on station at any one time. Over 900 in total uh, would be, you know, in service with basically 300 in, in, in station at any one time. The other 600 would either be in training or they'd be in transit or, or other uh, things like that. The intent was to build both of these vessels in tandem with each other. Uh, so, for example, 1948 would have one K-class submarine laid down. 1949 would have two. There would be two Tang classes in each of those years as well. 1950 production would ramp up to five, while no Tangs would be laid down. And then in 1951 through 1960, between two and three K-class subs would be laid down every year, as well as two Tang-class submarines each of those years. Uh, as it turned out, only the original three 
K classes ordered would end up being laid down, and only the first six Tang classes laid down in 47, 48, and 49 would end up being laid down as well. The K class did not have a reputable career. They were all out of commission before 1960. They were launched around 1951, and all, again, only had about eight years of service in them. The K boats were actually very advanced for their time. They had some impressive abilities to detect enemy submarines at distance, but the problem was they generally could only detect them if they were on the surface or were using their snorkels. Russian submarines had to be moving at over eight knots for them to be able to be detected. So while this was much better than, you know, other other classes of the time, it still wasn't really good enough to be terribly useful. Um, the submarines, again, only three of them were built, uh, but they were backstopped by some, I believe it was Gebalo class submarines, uh, which were converted in the Guppy class, uh, Guppy class upgrade. So as the K class did not end up getting more additions to its fleet, uh, there were some Guppy modifications which were brought in, and a new submarine division was created with the intention of um, essentially uh, building submarines that would specifically counter enemy submarines, so there would be SSKs, as we had previously mentioned. Uh, what, the, what this ended up meaning is that you had a lot of anti-submarine warfare drills that were going on in the early 1950s. Uh, there was a lot that was being learned. Um, the submarines would be mounted with Mark 16 torpedoes, which were unguided, uh, you know, modifications of the Mark 14. They would end up carrying eight torpedoes total. They would also end up carrying the Mark 35 uh, acoustic homing torpedo, which was kind of a smart torpedo, but it was only only used for anti-surface vessels. So it's interesting, you have an unguided torpedo which can be used against enemy submarines, and then you have acoustically guided Mark 35 torpedo which would be useful against enemy uh, surface vessels. At the end of the day, these weapons were primitive for their time, and again, unless an enemy submarine was at snorkeling depth and snorkeling, and you guessed right on its actual depth, or unless the enemy was, uh, you know, transiting on the surface, uh, these SSK boats, while modern for their time, turned out to be unable to really effectively be used in anti-submarine warfare. They also had a very short duration, which meant that they had to be based forward, all within a thousand miles of their patrol area, so they'd all need to be based in Western Europe. That was something that was already planned anyway, as we discussed previously in another video, but again, that limited their usefulness, uh, you know, in that they already had to be deployed to a crisis area before a crisis erupted, uh, if they were going to be useful. Um, there was, they were cramped boats, they were uncomfortable to be in, um, you know, they uh, were limited by uh, poor communication, it made it very difficult to coordinate between the submarine, the surface, and the air. Uh, again, they were very much kind of on their own, just with bad communication. I'm going to go back to this Cold War submarine book that I'm reading, uh, the, uh, and this is basically, as, as the boat book quotes, an epitaph of the K-boats was written by Captain Ned Kellogg, uh, who had served aboard the K-3 as a young officer. And I quote, Some of the good features of the class were its simplicity. It had dry induction mast, no mast induction valve, no conning tower, and therefore no safety tank, no less low pressure blower for the ballast tanks. Instead, a diesel exhaust was uh, exhaust blow system uh, was developed, similar to what the German submarine force used during World War II. A simple, remotely operated electrical control panel, which kept the battery always available for propulsion. The newest fire control system, all AC power rather than split between AC and DC. But the submarine suffered from having diesel engines that were difficult to maintain, an unreliable and insufficient fresh water plant, undependable electrical generators, and slow speed. Kellogg concluded, you just can't build an inexpensive submarine that is worth much at all unless you man her with a crew of courage and heart. So again, this was a stopgap attempt by the Navy to develop a cheap submarine that they could mass produce that could be used to counter the perceived threat of Russian submarines. The problem was, at the time, the technology wasn't there to allow a submarine like this to be effective against enemy submarines. Again, you had to find an enemy that was near the surface, that was on diesel engines, or that was moving incredibly fast, and this submarine just didn't have the speed if it wasn't already in position when an enemy submarine was, you know, coming out. This submarine just didn't have the speed to be able to catch up and, you know, do much at all uh, against, against the enemy in that scenario.
The concept of the hunter-killer was born with the K-Class, which again would later be changed to the Barracuda class, but the submarine simply was not yet at a technological development in order to be able to effectively counter the K or enemy submarines in anything but the most ideal of circumstances. Additionally, it sort of follows the mantra of you get what you paid for. Sometimes the military gets criticized for being too lavish with its expenses, but often when you try and cut costs too much, you, you need to realize that it also does cut capabilities. With that being said, guys, I'm going to go ahead and end this video here. I know I'm in the middle of a battle with an enemy Victor submarine. I've also got another enemy which I've identified as a Charlie, but there's about 20 minutes left to this fight, and I think it's an interesting fight against a uh, submarine that you don't see, or at least I haven't seen yet in this campaign. So I'll probably come back to this video uh, in a day or so, and it'll just be looking Looking at this battle using the live stream audio and then returning to history uh, the battle after that. So we've looked at the K-class submarine, we've kind of taken the Navy through uh, to the verge of the nuclear era and I think in our next video we'll either look at the development of technologies and systems that will allow U.S. submarines to be more effective or uh, we will look at uh, the nuclear submarine. I'm not sure which yet, uh, but it'll be a couple days away. Anyway, guys, uh, as the submarine here turns to avoid, uh, we'll leave it on a cliffhanger to see what happens next. Uh, but I hope you guys enjoyed the video. Uh, let me know your thoughts below. And until next time, this is the Historical Gamer saying thank you for watching, and I'm out. Ooh, look, that, sub that torpedo's diving toward us. I wonder if it's acquired us. All right, guys, see you later.